Hey folks, welcome to Narratives. Narratives is a podcast exploring the ways in which the world is better than in the past, the ways it is worse, and the paths towards a better, more definite vision of the future. I'm your host, Will Jarvis, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. You can find show notes, transcripts, and videos at narrativespodcast.com. Additionally, in this episode, my friend Lars Doucet joins us as a co-host. Well, Noah, how are you doing this afternoon? Hey, doing all right. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come on the show. Do you mind giving us a brief bio and some of the big ideas you're interested in? Brief bio. So, um, grew up in Texas, very close to where Lars lives. Um, then went to Stanford, majored in physics, uh, decided not to continue with that. Um, moved to Japan where I lived for, um, about three years there. And then, uh, just, you know, chilling, decided I wanted to become a famous econ blogger. And so I went, of course I did, you know, grad school cause you have to sort of do that. So I went and got a PhD at university of Michigan, worked as a professor for a couple of years at uh, SUNY Stony Brook. Then, um, sort of uh, just quit because I didn't really like academia at all and uh, and just did the blogging thing. And now I blog at Substack. My Substack is called No Opinion, N-O-A-H-P-I-N-I-O-N. And um, that's all I'm pretty much doing right now. Uh, yeah. Is that, was, was that tongue in cheek when you said you wanted to be a famous econ blogger? Was that the plan all along? Did it just kind of happen? It wasn't tongue in cheek. So it, that actually was why I went to grad school. Oh, really? That's awesome. Like, I wanted to be like Brad DeLong, you know, I wanted to do that. And yeah, like I, I never really wanted to be a professor. I just, I tried it out because sort of my advisors all insisted. Um, cause I think if they place professors, they look better, but then, um, but they insisted, Oh, just give it a try. Give it a try. So I did, you know, some things were fun. Mostly it wasn't for me. Uh, and so then I, I just left. And so now uh, here I am out in San Francisco. Now, I want to follow up on that because you said you wanted to be a famous econ blogger. And that wasn't just like an accident that happened to you. That was what you were actually trying to do. Um, but right. when you first set off on that, what being a famous econ blogger on the Internet looked like was probably a lot different than how it looks now. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts right. on. I didn't expect to do it as a job. I expected to do it just gotcha. as a hobby. I never expected to get paid money for it. I want my my dream was to just do whatever job, you know, I don't know, consulting or, you know, whatever. And then um, and then have a blog on the side because I thought that a econ blog would allow me to affect the national conversation, sort of inject good ideas into the mix, give good advice to people. I thought bloggers are, are going to be the most have the most outside in influence, you know, over the next couple of decades in terms of policy and ideas. That's the thing to be. And so even just as a hobby, I felt like I could make some sort of an impact. Yeah, well, that, that's that's kind of interesting to me because I remember um, I remember reading that, that sci-fi book, Ender's Game. And the most far-fetched part of the whole thing was not the 3D battle room, was not the space aliens, was not even what I now recognize to be the kind of deep dream style fantasy AI driven game, but the two teenagers taking over the world through posting was the like least like most far fetched aspect of that book to me. And it seems like I'm eating a little bit of crow on that um, in terms of kind of the, the influence that, well, actually let's talk about that is, is the tension between being terminally online and therefore completely out of touch with reality. And then online personalities, like having a lot more influence and ability to change the world than anyone expected. Um, right. So the thing about Ender's Game is you've got to be a really good blogger, <laughs> you know, like it's like all fantasies are just about people doing things unusually well. Well, a lot of anyway, um, I, I've tried to get my sister to, uh, to make the Locke and Demosthenes blog, Demosthenes blog, um, uh, with me, but she won't do it. She's a, a human rights lawyer. And so. You know, she can't really blog for her job. She uh, she works for the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission. Um, it would be great to have Locke and Demosthenes blog with her. So you're telling her that that she's Valentine, the, the, the soft-hearted, compassionate one, and you're the evil Machiavellian Peter? <laughs> I'm the evil Machiavellian brother. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. Like that, that sort of also makes me feel bad because I don't think I was that bad of a brother. 
You know, yeah. well, like, I, 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 I think you're okay. you're probably a little less sadistic than Peter was in Ender's Game. <laughs> a little less. In any case, to get us a little I like bunnies, a little bit on script. You know, um, you recently tweeted, you know, that there's four things we need in abundance right now, and you said housing, energy, healthcare, and dignity. And I think that's a good kind of overview start for this conversation. Can you talk a little bit about those things? Heck yeah. So, um, oh, that that's a Texanism, by the way. I definitely say heck. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, That's a good definitely, one. Definitely it's 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 a more it's more emphatic than hell. It sure is. Got a <laughs> sticks yeah, in so. there. Yes. Um so a number of people most prominently Ezra Klein and Derek Thompson have been uh but you know a bunch of people have been focusing on this idea of abundance. This idea that you know we we focus so much on on um well, I don't even want to talk about that. The point is that we we've neglected the 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 need to get people stuff, to get people a bunch of stuff, and we just sort of assumed that America was this land of abundance and it was all about dividing up the pie. But in fact, it's it's not uh, to a large degree. Um, we've hit sort of the limits of cheap free housing by sprawl, and we hit those limits in two thousand and six. Uh, how, how do we know specifically in two thousand and six that we hit those limits? Home building. Oh, okay. Can you can you um you just look at the home building statistics? Oh, they, they that just, was they, why. So in two thousand seven, we hit the limits of prices. In six, we hit the limits of like building out, basically. In seven, we hit the uh, and and I can you know get you some numbers on that. But in in seven, we hit the limits of prices, and then in eight, the financial system crashed. Interesting. Uh, so essentially, what happened was that we built out so far that people couldn't handle the commute. And is this what is this and, what they traditionally call like the the margin of productivity with like David Ricardo and all that? Exactly. Exactly. And of course, I mean, he was thinking of farms, but it really does a similar kind of thing. Um, there's very similar sort of inverse square laws to all of this. Um, there's classic economics models with inverse square laws, basically a monocentric city model. Um, you can get all of these models will spit out the idea that land value tax is, is awesome and should pay for everything. Um, so, so you would enjoy definitely playing models. to the host here, Noah. Yes. And so um, so you should check out those models, but they also basically say that you get to this periphery. And so we built too far out. Now, if you, we get self-driving, you know, electric cars or very fast transportation into the city, that's going to change. And remote work might change this. So there, if you have fully remote workers, they can go live in Bozeman and, you know, work for a company in, in Boston. Right. Right. And so like, so really, remote work and improved transportation technology might change this equation, but in the short term, we built out to our limits, and then uh, you know we started. Uh, and at the same time, knowledge economies, this, this so-called clustering economy, started taking over our economy. We uh, in in the twentieth century, we turned from an agricultural nation into the workshop of the world, a factory-based, industrial-based nation. Now, in your factory, it's not that expensive to ship stuff, especially if you don't care about burning a ton of coal and you have really good freight rail lines, which are both true of us. And so, in other words, you could put a factory out in bump up nowhere. Can I swear on this podcast? I don't know um, if we have a policy, but we'll beep it if we just sure, we don't. Go ahead. All right. I have Tourette so then, syndrome, so it's just an ever like danger at all times. So we're prepared for it. Oh, really? Do you have the kind of Tourette's that makes you swear? I have all the kinds of Tourette syndrome, unfortunately, including the one that makes you punch your best friend in the nuts every once in a while. That one's called copopraxia. Okay. What happens? I'll just do that. uh, So it's fine. Yeah. Maybe maybe don't go hang out. Yeah. I I, Um, I, I have like a bubble I keep around my friends for this reason. It's also why I work from home for 10 years. Wow. Um, Yeah. No, all the people I've met with Tourette's just, you know, had occasional like a long stammer yeah the more we talk about it um, the more it will happen so <laughs> anyway. oh wow okay so no anyway. no 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 so problem then, anyway. um the point is that that uh it, with factories we had this economy based on factories and then we could put the factories anywhere and we had these small towns later we connected them with the interstate at first it was just railroads and then um and then they could ship stuff anywhere around the country and then on ships to the world. And so that meant that we had this very even pattern of economic distribution around the country. Now, macro agglomeration effects and technology and all these things we could talk about have changed the game so that China is now the workshop of the world um, and to a lesser extent, other dense, densely populated places um, close to the Eurasian population center. And thus, 
Uh, you've seen that circle where it just circles China and India and is like more people live inside the circle than outside it. Right? Well, that's where the, the stuff is going to be made. And so um, we've been making less and less stuff as a proportion of our economy, not deindustrializing in an absolute sense, although a little bit of that, but then deindustrializing in a relative sense where it's less, less and less important to our economy. What became important, we stopped being the world's workshop and we started being the world's research park. Interesting. And so um, knowledge industries, which are software, high value added manufacturing, biotech, finance, and um, those are the basic four. Those knowledge industries became, you know, entertainment. There's some other things. Those those knowledge industries became the core of our economy. Now, I want to and I, I want to I want to yeah. probe you on something here. So you said yeah. agglomeration effect before. And so for the sake of our audience, that is something where um when you have a lot of productive activity in one place, that makes everybody more productive, right? You know, that's why people go to cities in the first place. And uh, that's right. But there's two kinds of effects here called agglomeration and clustering. And let me explain those. Okay. Agglomeration is um, about a whole bunch of different industries want to locate near each other. Okay. Uh, because, um, first of all, they supply each other. But also because a whole bunch, the consumers are also workers. So the workers want to live where the jobs are and the companies want to go where the consumers are. And so you get this massive agglomeration. New York is the most famous example of this. New York does everything. There's manufacturing in New York City. Right. Uh, everything is near to everything in New York. Like, um, like they have a garment district and a, they have a garment district, a diamond district, a this district, a that district. Exactly. You can get everything you need right there. And so that's sort of um, the original force of agglomeration. And that, that's what Paul Krugman's theories are, are about. And so, um, so this comes right from Krugman. And so, uh, so that's important. But then the second thing is clustering, which is within a single industry. So you have software, right? So with software, all the software companies want to locate next to the other software companies. Reason being uh, that number one, they can share employees and ideas. So employees will flow back and forth between the companies. Um, number two, uh, capital. Uh, is there so like venture capital within a certain industry? Um, you have all the VC firms right there in the Bay Area. You have, and then um, uh, so you have the tacit knowledge spillovers. You have the the concentration of capital, and you have thick markets within a specific um, domain. So you have when you have very highly specialized workers, software engineers, right? Who would be it would be very hard to retrain those people to go work in finance or bio. Not that hard, okay, but not super easy either. Um, it would take them years to get used to the new industry. And so uh, basically you have these super specialized workers. Everyone, every software company wants to be NSF because that's where the best engineers are, because that's where the ideas are, and because that's where the venture capital is. That is called a clustering effect. It's within a single industry. So we're moving away from the model of everything gets done locally to, you know, of, because everything's manufacturing based to this, everything, you know, the, the most important economic activities are knowledge based and they cluster together um, in these cities with a huge number of educated people, right? So you can name, you can count on like a couple hands, the cities that have been the winners, the big winners of this, San Francisco, New York, LA, Seattle, um, you know, Austin, and, a, you know, a few others, and then the college towns, right? You've got like Ann Arbor, uh, College Station's getting there, woo um, and then, uh, you know, other places like that, Madison, Wisconsin. And so then um, that's been the driver of a lot of this housing unaffordability in the big cities. If you look at housing prices overall in America, they haven't gone up that much. They've actually gone up about the same rate as incomes. So you're paying about the same percent of your income if you're just a median schlub. You're paying the same percent of your income for your housing whether you're buying or renting now as you were in 1980, right? But but that there's huge geographic variation because, um, you know, if you're out in wherever, like, you know, some decaying factory town in Indiana, it sucks to be there. And yeah, the house is cheap, but it sucks to live there. And half the people leave and the, re the other half can't pay for the upkeep of the roads and the public goods and everything starts to crumble and then everybody does a bunch of meth and then e everything's full of meth heads and the meth heads start hanging out in the shuttered stores and pretty much you're a meth town and then you suck and then you vote for Trump or something. And so then that sucks. Uh, and meanwhile, everyone's piling into these cities, but the, the landlords have taken all the value from that. 
the companies and the workers are creating the value, you know, and the landlords are just taking it. This idea that companies are appropriating all the value from the workers and this Marxist blah, 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 that was in an era of cheap land that Marx thought of that. Marx, like Henry George was out there in a, in an, you know, in a place where there was expensive land. And he was saying, no, it's the landlords taking it all, guys. Like that seemed an antiquated notion to Marx because uh, everyone was building out these factory towns. Um, George happened to live in a place where land was really scarce. Uh, at that time, land is scarce everywhere now and clustering makes it more scarce because every single software engineer is piling into Silicon Valley. Okay, so And so, every single finance person's piling into New York, or at least was. And so when you're saying clustering, you mean like within a specific industry and you're saying like the effect mm. of clustering specific to knowledge industries is stronger than it was for old school agglomeration? That's right. Because old school agglomeration was, was limited <clears throat> by the fact that you could ship stuff from, from cheaper places out of town. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You know, you had a lot of manufacturing in New York City, but you had a lot of manufacturing in upstate New York. Right. That would ship stuff to New York City or even in Germany that would ship stuff to New York across the sea. So like because ocean transport's always cheaper than land. OK, so let, let, um, let, let, that's physics. Let's probe here on the whole um, work from home angle. Right. Because if we go to work from home, we've kind of invented like crappy teleportation. Right. I can send my face and my words somewhere, even if I can't physically be there. And it's not as good as being there in person for certain things. But like I can have a meeting and I can talk to a person and I can talk to Noah Smith and Will Jarvis, even though yeah. I have no idea where the two of you are right now. You know, and we can do this right. and we can do lots of other things, too. Um, but even so, it's not quite the same as me being able to teleport from Pluto because um, there needs to be good Internet like freaking here physically. And there also needs to be like food in my refrigerator somehow and other services and, and local industry to like keep me alive and happy and entertained or whatever else I want. Right. So what effect does work from home in your opinion have on the clustering effect and, um, on, um, just the margin of production in general, you know, we do not know yet. Okay. That is a giant question. It is Everyone's been talking about the death of distance, mm -hmm. right? If we have teleportation, we can live anywhere. If you've read the Hyperion books, uh, everyone just has these teleporters and they just live out on some like lonely abandoned planet out there in the universe and then just like step into the bathroom on a different planet. And so that is the, the true death of distance. Um, spoiler, that doesn't work out. But anyway, <laughs> so read, read Hyperion. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> um, in real life, we don't know how well that's going to work because um, at the office, you have serendipitous interactions that build relationships, allow net build your human networks, allow exchange of tacit ideas and allow for a sort of, you know, I guess, competitive organization, ladder climbing and stuff like that. Um, uh, you have that. You have um, interviewing. It's very hard to interview remotely. Uh, even if hanging out in person is just 25 percent better or whatever than than online that will add up across a huge number of people and clustering will still be very robust. So my guess is that there's going to be a bifurcation. We're going to have, we're going to have um, 85, 90% of people uh, work in the office three days a week or whatever, and then work flexibly, work from home, et cetera. And so there's going to be a reallocation of working within the city, but everyone's still going to live in the city. And then 10 to 15%, I think, are going to go full remote and they're going to live in Bozeman, Bangladesh. I mean, you can't go too far out of the time zone. It becomes harder. But um, they're, those people are going to go live in, in, you know, Vietnam or somewhere or, or just, uh, you know, Bozeman, Montana. That's, I think uh, hot new town. I think there's also like two interesting angles to explore with that. I'm, I've learned not to do double barreled questions. So I'll ask one, but I'll just make a mental note about the second one. Um, one is that... But what about the effect of making basically giant virtual bedroom communities? Like, where aren't we already seeing effects of like housing being bid up in places where it's cheap to live and they have good internet and you can telecommute into Austin or whatever? Or are we not seeing that? Absolutely, absolutely. And so that's that's um, when I said Bozeman, I really just mean I'm using that as a stand-in for like any place, mm -hmm. any any pop-up bedroom community. And I guess my point is that this. My prediction is this will take the edge off clustering effects by 10 to 15 percent. Okay. But that's not going to be significant enough where this problem goes away. I see. Now, I think we're seeing distortions in the numbers. I think we're seeing a giant price spike in these cities. That's not going to last. That's just the inflationary 
excess pandemic demand era. Mm -hmm. That's going to subside pretty soon. We're also seeing a reallocation between commercial real estate and um, and residential real estate because of the flex time work thing within cities. Mm -hmm. That's going to be important. But I think that the the full work from home, you know, uh, teleportation kind of idea, that is going to be marginal. Um, and so we're still going to have this problem of clustering. We're still going to have this problem where we can't get enough, uh, get enough housing unless we build it near the big cities, near the, near the fancy towns, big cities and college towns, knowledge hubs and college towns. Those are the places, the, uh, the Bay areas and the Ann Arbors of the world are the places we need to build the housing. And that doesn't mean we need to build it right in the middle of San Francisco. Uh, although that would be nice. Dean Preston should allow a lot of housing in his district, uh, in San Francisco. But that's not going to really solve the problem completely. It's, it'll take the edge off. But what will really solve the problem is if every city in the Bay Area has some sort of incentive to build housing. If Daly City has incentive to build housing, if South San Francisco and Burlingame and San Mateo and Oakland and Fremont and Berkeley and Marin and all these places just build a lot of housing and then people can commute into the city like they do in New York or like they do in Tokyo. So on, on that note, go ahead, Will. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm probably going to ask the same question Lars was going to ask here, but correct me if I'm wrong here, Lars. Uh, how possible is it for us to push through zoning reform in the U.S., given, you know, housing is kind of a backbone of wealth for kind of this middle class, upper middle class that has kind of emerged in the United States? Well, it's that's a problem, but it's not as much of a problem as you think. So the I have to say that the idea that NIMBYism is around preserving property values is wrong. Oh, really? That's wrong. Interesting. Why is it wrong? Um, no, that's really interesting. Because, NIMBY, because, because when you build new housing, it doesn't lower property values. Interesting. It, it raises them. So, so are they wrong in that they believe erroneously that it will reduce their property values or they don't believe it will reduce their property values and that's not why they're doing it, but we, we, we believe erroneously that that's why they're doing it. It is a euphemism. Okay. Some people's property values will go down. Some will go up. More will go up than will go down. Some people's property values really will go down. And, they, you know, lower my property values has been a euphemism since the age of white flight. And it is very clear exactly what it is a euphemism for. It is for poor people, especially poor black people, but not just poor black people, moving in near you. This idea that if, the, if you have apartment complex with poor people living nearby, then the wrong sort of people will move in there and then the neighborhood will go to hell. Mm -hmm. That is, the, or if or if you put in a train stop, then the wrong sort of people will ride the train to your stop, get off and start walking around in front of your house where your little children are playing, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. That has been the fear of um, white flight type of people for a long time. And it is not, we call it white flight because it came from an era where America was primarily white and black people and black people were much poorer. Black people are still poorer, but now, you know, we have a, a much more multiracial uh, nation and um, but but the the basic pattern remains. Mm. So it's more about basic preserving neighborhood character, which is something that's preserving neighborhood said. character. Right. And that is not a euphemism. It's a euphemism, but it's true. It's like, yes, a dense neighborhood <laughs> will have a different character than your sleepy little suburb where only rich people live. That's the point. Right. Like we don't want to preserve your neighborhood character. So that's why people are NIMBYs. And there's a lot of strategies we can do to sort of mitigate that NIMBYism, but we're not going to actually destroy the model, the housing based wealth model in the United States. Mm -hmm. We are not going to destroy that by building dense housing. That, that model is alive and well in New York city, the densest city in the country. I promise you, New Yorkers property values are doing great. Mm -hmm. I promise that building housing in Manhattan does not lower those people's property values. Um, and so the, so the, the homeowner class is going to do fine. You know, it's it's property tax that threatens the homeowner class. That's where the, right. you know, property tax, including land value tax, that is where the real fight is over housing wealth and these people like, oh, my house is all I have for retirement. And then you have all that stuff. And that is where that fight is. But in terms of, of zoning uh, liberalization, it's all just about keeping the poor people out of your neighborhood. So, That's I it. mean, do you think That's that means... Game. Zoning reform will be easy, so to speak, if we if we start pushing. No, that. it won't be easy because you know, sort of this staying away from people you don't want to live next to is sort of the American national pastime. Right. <laughs> Anyone who tells you it's baseball or sex is wrong. Right. It's that. <laughs> it's exclusionary zoning. That's the American <laughs> national pastime. Well, and so then we, um, 
So, so the, the answer is to do it at the state level. Okay. Everyone knows housing needs to be increased. No one wants it in their backyard. Instead, they'll kick it up to the state level and the state will simply order municipalities to build more housing. And they're doing that right now. You can see this with housing elements. So you guys know about housing elements. Tell me about housing elements. Okay. Basically, the state says you have to, you have, to have a plan to build this much housing. What's your plan? And then people are like, okay, here's my plan. It's complete bullshit. And it will actually build only about one tenth of the housing that we claim in this report. And the state's like, no. And if the state says no, then you have a period of time where anyone is allowed to build anything. And it's like, ah, chaos. And so then at least oh. in California. So, so, so the threat so is, then, so that's the stick is it's like, it's like, I'll allow you to have your plan, but if I don't like it, then all the cowboys can build whatever the F they want. Yes. Interesting. And that's the idea. And that is the, really the tool. And have we seen success with this? Are, are these zoning reform movements succeeding in places? Well, LA's housing element got rejected, I believe. Um, let me just make sure that that, that actually happened. Instead, they were just threatening to. Um, state rejects LA housing plan update. That's from February. State housing regulators rejected Los Angeles' blueprint for increased development over the next eight years, telling the city it must rezone by mid-October to accommodate 255,000 new homes instead of over the next three years or risk losing ha risk losing access to affordable housing grants. Okay, so then... Um, so is this kind of like how so they, that, they the, the federal government uses highway funding to like push people on like the drinking age laws and stuff? Right. So... Um, but there is, I believe there's another stick where they have like, um, you, you have like massive upzoning if, if the, uh, if the housing element doesn't work. So basically if you want to be NIMBY, you've got to come up with a plan to not be too NIMBY. Gotcha. Um, but, but I have to, to look more into the legal particulars of, of what the stick is on that. But anyway, so then this is really what you do. Uh, and of course there's other things you can do like, um, automatically allowing by right by, you know, as of right construction in various locations like Scott Wiener's bill and what is by public of, housing and what is, is what is by right construction as of right construction I'm sorry uh by right's a grocery store um as of right construction is uh basically like if you've got all the permits and you meet all the qualifications you can just start building and no one can hold you up okay so it means you don't have to like ask for a zoning variance or whatever like it, right 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the lowest burden of paperwork to just go build correct Gotcha. And so then, so that is very effective. Uh, yes. And, and you can do things like eliminating parking minimums and eliminating setback requirements and blah, 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 blah. And the mandatory allowance of like um, duplex and multiplex conversions, which is very attractive for homeowners looking to get extra income, which is why it's you is, know, kind of cool. Is that when but, you take an existing house and split it into two dwellings or whatever? Exactly right. Exactly right. And it's like, well, you know, or, or you can add an ADU, you can add one of these little like in-law units in the back and then that's accessory dwelling unit, right? Accessory dwelling units and in-law, yeah. uh, as they're called. And that's, you get an extra person there. It's like you get a tenant. Suddenly you're living in the same house, but now you're a landlord, right? Now you get money, you get cash and you can monetize your house and, you know, and still, and yet still live in it. And so that's pretty cool. Um, duplex. Uh, and like um, triplex conversions or whatever, that can often make a, a homeowner more money or, or a landlord more money if you have like a second home, you want to do that and rent it out, blah, blah, blah. And is this what uh, we so all it's... call missing middle housing where it's like, it's like a lot of people when they That's hear right. density, they think I'm going to come in and plunk a tower right in the middle of your single family neighborhood. That's right. This is, this is missing middle housing. And so that's like you already well, know every single answer to this, and you are explaining these to the podcast listeners. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the shtick. <laughs> that isn't is it? what is happening right now. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. So I've, thank you for knows. translating. Yeah, we got we got um, to do it on some right. of these more like econ heavy jargony podcasts. Just that absolutely. Please do. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah. So basically, these are the this is what's going on with housing abundance. Um. But we're moving, you know, I just wrote a blog post about that the other day about how we're sort of moving from this era where everybody fought over the methods by which things would get done. Do we want the government doing this or do we want the private sector doing this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> do we want developers making profits? Do we really want to raise taxes? <laughs> Shut up. Just build more housing. So the point is that the houses exist. 
And then how you get there is of secondary importance. So I think that in crunch time, you throw out this squabbling over methods and go instead for just focus on goals. And I think that's that's happening successfully in housing. It has not yet happened successfully in healthcare or energy. Okay, so, so, so can you clarify a little bit? Like, so, so you're saying goals, not methods. And your example, uh, I'm just gonna repeat back what you said, just make sure I understand it, is that, and this isn't just for the audience, I'm actually hmm. making sure here, is that, so like <laughs> methods focused is like, okay, so if I'm on the left, I'm like, well, housing would be good, but it has to happen according to nice, good little Marxist principles and nobody can earn any money. And if I'm on the right, I'm like, well, housing can happen, but the government can't be involved in any way because that's, that's, that's tyranny and theft or whatever. Is that kind of what you're getting at? And you're like, the point exactly. is you get housing to happen and I don't care how. Right. So in, you know, you've had in, in housing stuff, you know, I, in fact, I'm, I'm having some success converting people to this idea. I just talked to a libertarian guy in San Francisco who says, oh, we can't do public housing because the state has low capacity and can't do it and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, build the housing. If it doesn't get built because the state has low capacity, then fine. They've got to learn somehow, uh, you know, but just, but just do the thing. And so then I'm, you know, I, I think that that argument is finding resonance. And on the, on the left side of things, I think I'm having, we are having success convincing people that actually allowing private development is not the end of the world. And it actually helps middle class and poor people. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's been slow going because a lot of the people who want to keep their neighborhoods exactly the same, i.e. not let the poor people in, they fight very, very hard to claim that allowing any new construction is will cause gentrification, rising rents, uh, displacement, destruction, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's wrong. Uh, we just, there's just no evidence for that. Even in the short term? Um, yeah. Yep. Nothing. Like, we've looked for evidence for it. It's just not there. It's like, no, if you build more, rents go down. It's like, very, that's not true for everything. You know, if you build more highway extensions, often you'll have an increase in traffic. Not always, but you can. Um, but it turns out with housing, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty simple. Interesting. Now you were, you know, this, you this were, sort of myth that if you build this big building for yuppies, then all the other yuppies will be like, well, that's a cool new neighborhood. I want to move there. Go. And then you'll just draw in yuppies from far and wide. It turns out that doesn't really happen. What happens instead? Instead, the yuppies were already moving there because what they really move for is their jobs. What yuppies are really moving to San Francisco for is their jobs, right? They're, that's where their company is. That's where their job is. They move to San Francisco for the job, and then they look for a place to live. And what's happening is that they're going around essentially bidding up and turfing out the middle-class families from these small apartment buildings that abound in San Francisco. So that when you build them a giant fish tank on a spot that used to be a parking lot or something, you build them a giant fish tank, right, to hold the yuppies. And the yuppies are like, well, I could you know, live in this aging Victorian with no climate control and no insulation and blah, 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 and spend all this money remodeling. Or I could just go live in this place with this pool and this common area with other yuppies. What am I going, and gate security and whatever. What am I going to do? I'm going to live in the yuppie fish tank, like nine out of 10. We'll choose that. We've sort of left the era where yuppies wanted to pretend that they were bohemians by going and just like living in you know, like college dorms forever. I think that, that that was the 2000s, really. The Jack Dorsey era. But we've sort of left that. And now yuppies are willing to be yuppies. <laughs> and then, you know, we, we build these fish tanks and then they just, they go there. And then, you know, it's like, we're saving your neighborhood from a yuppie by, by, by sticking them in these yuppie pens <laughs> called, you know, market rate housing development. <laughs> I just realized and that yuppie rhymes with guppy. And so that's a successful <laughs> yeah, pun. That's good. It, that's good. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is that is where that comes from. So. Well, well, Noah, why why have we gotten to pragmatism uh, in housing and not healthcare and energy? It seems like yeah. there's clear paths forward for energy, right? Nuclear power, all kinds of right. different stuff. Uh, you know, healthcare maybe less clear, but but why have those two been so resistant? Yeah, hit us with goals and methods for healthcare and energy. Yeah. So, all right, so so let's talk about energy first, because energy there is there is lots of room for very rapid and immediate progress on this idea. The fact is a lot of people's jobs depend on oil and gas and those, those regions where those places provide employment, such as Texas have fought very hard or a lot of people, at least the Republicans 
in those areas, and sometimes occasionally Democrats like Manchin, have fought very, very hard to keep fossil fuel industries alive so that people will be able to keep doing the same jobs they did. We hear about coal miners, but that's only a small part of it. Mostly we're talking about people who work in the oil and gas industry, shale. And these are blue collar jobs too. You know, these are these right. are the kind of things like good manufacturing jobs disappeared, but then you can still, as a blue collar person with just a high school degree, you can get a very good salary working on like an offshore oil platform or something like that, working at a shale drilling place. Like that's where blue collar people can still make a good living. And now we want to get rid of that and, you know, Sure, you'll be able to get a job installing solar panels, but it might not pay as much. Um, and so, so that's that's a problem. That that's difficulty. There's also there's there's nimbyism in terms of um, energy as well, because uh, a lot of these sort of legacy environmental groups value open space. They're like, we like having a nice view of the mesa, so we don't want you to build solar there because it looks unsightly. And that's these NIMBYs. That's the NIMBY voice, by the way. And so that, that's like you can't this, like, you can't build this wind farm because it might kill a bird, and that means we keep the coal plant open, which kills a hundred times as many. Right, and and it's not even killing the bird. I mean, like for some, like Audubon Society maybe cares about killing birds, but then um, the uh, no, it's it's uh, views. It's people's views. Interesting. It's people, people want to have their nice views of hills without wind farms. Apparently the hills with wind farms look worse to them. Now, I think the hills with the wind farms look better. I actually do think solar plants look bad personally, but I think the wind farms look great. Like I love the force of windmills. They're just majestic and great. People have different opinions and Americans have terrible taste in like everything. You're just making tons of friends today, Noah. Yeah. Americans have terrible aesthetic taste. We, we just wear t-shirt and jeans. That's all we wear is t-shirt and jeans. The only kind of architecture we know that we like are Brooklyn brownstones. That's the only kind of building that anyone knows that they like. I like Brooklyn brownstones. That's like, urbanists are just like, just now learning to appreciate a diversity of architectural styles, like after years of just thinking brownstone was the only good one that was possible. And Americans are rubes. We're hicks. We're a nation of hicks, and that's fine. You know, we're a nation of hicks that's having to become a nation of cities. It's Peasants into Frenchmen here, which is a great book, by the way. But we are, you know, we are experiencing the infill of a country that was once defined by extensive frontiers. We spread out and out in the wagons, you know, slaughtering Native Americans. I'm sorry about that. Um, and we, you know, dispossessing people. But we, we were this country of frontiers. We spread out and later we spread out into the suburbs. We built out into the exurbs. We built these giant McMansions that were two hours away from a city. And, you know, we sprawled that way. So we had all these frontiers of land and we're done with that, at least until remote work gets much better and gets to be real teleportation. And at least until that, or, you know, maybe self-driving electric cars, personal air transport. I don't know. Until then, we're out of land frontiers. We've got to infill. We've got to go in back and fill in the spaces that we sprawled into before. And this is really what... um, that's our that's our quest now, and you can see this with socially as well. And that's with the redistribution of uh, the the production of increased dignity is that our society was a society where since everyone could really spread out, we could all be assholes to each other all the time because good fences made good neighbors, and we could be assholes as long as we didn't have to see each other that much because you could put up a fence, right? And now if we're having to fill in this whole thing, we're gonna have to. We're going to need to make room for people. And this is true at the social level as well. A lot of people that we didn't give dignity to, we're going to have to give dignity to. And so I think you see with young people, the body positivity movement. It's like, can we please stop making fun of fat people? Because that's shitty. And like, that's, there's no reason you that that we have to make fun of fat people. There's no reason that we have to tell fat people they, they look bad. Like, that's mean. That's bad. Um, and so, so... We don't have to redistribute dignity. It's not thin people are not going to be hurt if we stop insulting fat people, right? It's just now, now we accept a greater number of people. So you can produce this abundance of dignity. And I think that the internet has brought us closer together. Um, even more than dense neighborhoods, I think the internet is bringing us closer together. And we're having to infill our culture in ways because we can't just say, all those other people suck and I'm just going to walk away from them anymore because everybody's sort of in the same room with everybody else on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, um, TikTok. And then because of that, 
we are having to, we're, we're confronting the fact that our society denied dignity to a lot of people. And I think ultimately the social movement that people call wokeness is largely about that. It's about, you know, like we, we can't, you know, we can't have like a bunch of all our like movies and TV shows have like zero Asian people in them anymore. It's just not, that's not cool. That's like denying people dignity that they deserve. Right. right? We, we, um, yeah, we, we can't have like, uh, there's anyway, all, all that stuff that doesn't mean I'm on board with everything woke, right? It doesn't mean I'm like, woke people are right about everything. No, but I think that there was a reason for that movement, which was, um, people realized that there were a lot of people who just weren't getting dignity in our society, weren't being afforded dignity by our culture. And what we need to do instead of focusing on redistribution of dignity, instead of redistribution of like, you know, we've got to, we've got to like, you know, hate on men so that women can do better. No, that's re that's redistributionary thinking. That is sort of, you know, uh, a communism of respect, right? Like zero Liquidate sum flag. dignity. Right. We, like we've, we've got to shit on some people so other people feel good. No, we've got to produce dignity for everybody. We've got to have an inclusive society where basically everyone gets respected instead of just, you know, and there's not, we don't think of it as like some people have to be disrespected in order to respect these other people. We've got to just respect everybody. We've got to increase respect for everybody. And I, I feel that that was sort of the original ideal of democracy in America. If you read, you know, um, Alexis de Tocqueville, you read a lot of stuff. Um, that was sort of the democratic ideal was a lot about social respect was like everyone, everyone gets respect. And that's in some ways, that's the idea behind our housing uh, dreams as well. The idea that, you know, like your home is your castle, you know, um, Huey Long, what was Huey Long's uh, campaign slogan? Every man, a king. And chicken every pot, um, or is that someone else? Uh, no, that was uh, chicken every pot. Was I don't remember Warren Harding, maybe, maybe Calvin Coolidge. I don't remember. Anyway, uh, but but every man a king. That was the idea. Of course, a little sexist, but okay. Um, and the idea that there's this egalitarian impulse in America that we've forgotten. The way to create that egalitarianism is to build up everybody is to create more dignity in our society. Now here's, here's stop being a bunch of assholes and shitting on people to make ourselves feel good about ourselves. Now here, here's some thoughts I have because I am a Norwegian in addition to being a Texan. I'm a Norwegian citizen. My mother's an immigrant. I was born in Texas and raised in Texas. Mm. And what's really interesting having a foot in both countries is Norway compared to Texas. Texas is sometimes like seen as like, you know, we don't bow to any Kings. It's, it's like you compare it to like posh London. It's like, you know, seems like maybe not a super stratified society, but I've never been anywhere right. in the world. I stayed in a hotel next to the king's house yeah. in Norway. <laughs> yeah, well, so, the king was my neighbor. Exactly. Well, so what's crazy in Norway is I've never been to a place that's as radically egalitarian as that. I mean, it's got its stuff. But like um, in Norway, like one of the things my wife said to me when we came back was it's like there's so many blue collar people here that – like are not like super conscious that they're blue collar. Like your cousin is an electrician and that's like the same as if he was like a like, like um, uh, an insurance salesman or a dentist or something like he has a good wage. He owns a house, you know, he has, and he has res the respect that he would have here in, in America if he was white collar. And in America, as much as we think that we're doing better than the British in terms of like poshness and class, like we very much have those divides. I mean, racially, of course, but even aside from that, you know, and it's, it wasn't until she pointed out to me, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that really is there. And um, I mean, in Norway, it's like, I'm not saying like, we don't have hierarchies, like there's all, get a Norwegian in their cups and they will say some interesting things about immigrants, for instance. Um, but um, additionally, like there's this notion in Norwegian culture called the law of Yante. It's kind of pan-Scandinavian of just like, um, like being too unegalitarian is like a way to like make everyone hate you, you know, is, is that it, right. it's a very aggressive kind of egalitarianism. Um, not Getting quite too big for your britches. Yeah. Not, not quite like French style, but, um, one, but it's interesting because it's an explicit goal of the country. And you see that like the King was, a the, the whole Royal family was elected a hundred years ago or something. Like they had the choice to be a Republic and they picked a King and, and he seems to have gotten the message that that was, you know, like he, everyone loves to take pictures of him whenever he's on public transport and stuff. 
you know? Um, but so with dignity, it's interesting that you want to move it to a zero sum path because some people say dignity is inherently zero sum because it's about a linear rank of where you are in the pecking order. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, here's like, and high school is like the perfect example. You're stuck in high school. There's no other social context. You are rank. I mean, I mean, some of them even rank you academically, but I just mean like socially, like, and it's very clear who's where it's like prison in that way. And, um, so <laughs> do, so I yes, think what is. you're saying is like the way to Food is similar too. is, is the way to make, um, get us out of the zero sum redistribution fight about dignity where me getting more dignity means taking dignity away from you is to like create more like social contexts or whatever, or what do you think? I do think that is right. And I think that deserves its own whole podcast. Mm. Uh, I think you hit upon it exactly. Um, but, uh, but I, I think that um, it is so, so when you're talking about status, that's very hard to make positive sum because status is based on hierarchies. And you're saying status is not dignity. Is not. Dignity is not. Right. You do not, the, you know, nobody having to bow to anyone as they walk past, mm -hmm. like nobody's dignity depends on being bowed to. Mm -hmm. Status, yes. If I want to be like, you know, a, a big shot, then absolutely. But if if what you want is to just be, you know, just to like have basic dignity as like a citizen and be respected and, and things like that, that doesn't actually require anyone to bow to you. And so you can, you can create it for everybody. It doesn't require tearing anyone down to build other people up in terms of dignity, in terms of status, it does. So I think de-emphasizing status and emphasizing dignity mm -hmm. and respect more is the key. Interesting. We've got it. Just you're a person, you deserve dignity, you deserve respect, you're a citizen of this country, even if you're not a citizen, you just have a green card, I'm not going to disrespect you, but you, um, but you deserve respect. Right. Right. And then I deserve respect, you deserve respect. And that is the idea that America is missing. That is an idea of abundance that I think would, would heal or at least, you know, ameliorate many of our current social uh disruptions many of our current social divides if we can just create a culture move our culture toward a culture that is not based on finding reasons to shit on people all the time and so and and that's what this culture of abundance can do well well no I, th this brings up a, a great question we have you know we've had many guests on the podcast talk about political polarization we've probably had 10 now that have, that have talked about it kind of in depth uh Pretty much all of them come up with the answer. It's social media. Like that—that that is the answer. Kind of we get back. Uh, what's your thought on that? What What is driving this kind of uh, political polarization we have? And does the answer have to do with like not giving people dignity or something like that? There's a bunch of stuff. Um, what's not driving it, by the way, is uh, immigration. That is just not a factor behind political power. In fact, that's going to, that's going to reduce political polarization because when a whole bunch of conservative Hispanic people start voting Republican, <laughs> it's just going to blow everybody's, you know, uh, expectations out of the water and they're going to go, uh, and then like their narratives are going to go out the window. But, um, so it's not, it's not immigration. It is a uh, part of it's the internet, you know, Twitter, especially, I would say that, that Twitter's worse than Facebook because Facebook has replaced the old chain emails and drudge report and all that crap. But then Twitter's created something new, which is dunk mobs, just warring dunk mobs all day. And we've we've taken all the journalists and politicians in America and thought leaders and trapped them in a room with dunking teenagers all day. And that's who they hear all day is just these asshole like teenagers just, you know, and and just unhappy people just screaming and ranting like Syrah Rao or some shit all day is what they're being exposed to. Anyway, Twitter's terrible and we could do a whole nother podcast about that. A, a second factor is the big sort. Um, so if you read that, that, uh, book, it's about how basically, um, liberals were like, well, we don't want to live in a, you know, small podunk town where everybody's conservative. So we're going to move to a college town or a coastal city. Right. And then you can see the big sort within Texas. People move to Austin, like liberals move to Austin. That's where we got the culture of like slacker and Richard Linklater movies and stuff. We, that was, um, and like eighties, nineties, Austin is where we got that, um, and then in the whole country, you know, people would move to San Francisco, to New York, to San Diego, to Portland, to wherever, right? To the coast, Boston, D.C. And so then um, 
and and then we sorted ourselves. Now all the liberals are really mad because the you know the way we we divide up electoral votes and and districts and all this stuff really downweights urban agglomerations and cities in terms of the political power they get. And so they're really mad, but that's what they got because they they moved away. They they want to still be able to to control the government while physically removing themselves from the rednecks that they didn't like growing up with. Um, and so that's, that's a problem because our system's not set up to do that. Um, but also it means that everyone can sit there in their own town and imagine that people far away are the bad guys. You know, like you can sit in San Francisco and imagine that the world would be great if it weren't just for these Republicans. And then locally, what are you doing? You're, you're a progressive quote unquote, but you're voting to block housing. You're a Republican, you're voting Democrat, but you're a Republican. You don't want poor people living next to you. That's, you know, you don't especially want to pay more taxes, stuff like that. Maybe you vote to ban drinking straws or some useless crap like that, but you are functionally Republican and yet you're sitting there telling yourself all day that it's it's those people in the red states that are, you know, that are ruining this country. <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, and, 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 and if California ever, ever, ever seceded, you'd get, conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats dividing up very quickly, right? It's only because it's part of this greater unit that all the Californians can imagine, well, I'm a good progressive. And if if this nation were just California, it would be so much better, blah, blah, blah. No, it would be the same. You'd vote. I mean, there would be a few differences like gun laws. Mostly it would be the same. Um, and so, Oh, but people don't realize that. So this sort, this big sort and the treating of po political groups like sports teams that you cheer for and that you get like the only time I've ever seen hatred similar to the hatred of Republicans and Democrats in this country is Michigan versus Ohio State. That's the only thing I've seen that approaches it. And it's the same thing. It's like. You know, people are just watching these elections like sports teams and and a few people are realizing like actually the you know the one party wins the election or another party there's sometimes there's consequences and sometimes there's not consequences but then it's like what's funny when you compare them to sports people be like he's not taking politics seriously enough and i'm like no i think you're not understanding how much people care about sports <laughs> exactly <laughs> like i have i have had to physically run from opposing team fans like um no i i had to as a college kid i had to physically run from berkeley kids People, people, Berkeley kids. Th th this always came up in, in like, whenever people are talking about like how video games are dangerous, I'm like, are they more dangerous than sports? And I don't mean the sports. <laughs> I mean the fans. Like what's the number of murders per year of a call of duty fan versus like, you know, football hooligans, right? Right. Even make it murders right. no, per sports, capita per fan. Right. Sports is like what, what we do when we don't have video games. And right. It's, Sports is war. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, sports, sports, sports is is domesticated war, and yeah, absolutely, it's, it's it's less worse than the alternative. All right. So I, I know we have to go soon. Let me give you the thirty second rundown of why abundance in healthcare will be the hardest. It's because healthcare is what we've you is the vehicle we've used to create middle class mass middle class employment hmm. in the era of knowledge industries and the decline of manufacturing. It, healthcare was what everyone went into, and that's what sustains the middle class. And so it's very difficult to make super productive healthcare and cut costs because that's where everybody works and where everybody, you know, building a bunch of houses isn't really going to destroy people's property values. So it's not really going to destroy middle class wealth. But I guarantee you that making healthcare more productive will destroy middle class income for a large swath of people, even though eventually they'll be reallocated to better jobs. I can't even tell you what those jobs will be. And when we when we destroyed all the manufacturing jobs and shipped them to China or automated them or or just like whatever, um, we didn't, you know, everybody went into healthcare. The question is, what will the people do now? The answer was healthcare. We don't have an answer lined up after healthcare. And that's why creating true abundance in healthcare, which requires dramatically reducing prices, will be very difficult politically. Interesting. Cool. Well, we'll, we'll bring it off on a, a favorite George's topic is natural resources are another kind of under-discussed aspect of land, right? It's not exactly the same as like territory or locations. But like Norway famously has, you know, this natural resource fund and um, they manage their hydropower, their energy sector, much like they manage the oil sector on the premise that the pre-existing natural resources, in this case, water and oil, belong to the Norwegian people. And so the windfall profits should go to them. Um, do you think such a model could be helpful for dealing with our energy sector here in America? I really do think so. I think that... Um 
we have some of the resource curse here because Exxon and all those companies contribute heavily to the Republican Party. Um, that's not going to solve all our problems because who wants to shift away from oil when oil gives us like Alaskans get the Alaska Permanent Fund, right? Right. They get Alaskans get a dividend from all the oil that's produced in Alaska, but Alaskans really value the oil industry for this reason. You get rid of oil, where's the dividend coming from? Where's our monthly check coming from? And so, so are you saying that causes um, so path dependence? It do, there is path dependence, absolutely. So that, while that's an interesting thing for some problems, like it, it can alleviate some of the political problems, but it can't alleviate ultimately the political economic problem. What we really just have to do is sell consumers on cheap electricity so that we build solar and, and wind, but especially solar. Okay. Um, how would you like some cheap electricity? Yes, there will be these 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 black panels there, but you'll get used to it. How about some cheap electricity? Would you like that? And that's why solar power has to get cheaper than fossil fuels. N not coal, because everyone hates coal smoke. That's just makes the world bad, mm -hmm. but cheaper than natural gas. Solar has to get considerably cheaper than natural gas. So the pitch for solar can be, how would you like abundant electricity, cheap electricity? It can't just be Global warming is going to kill us all. How about we reduce our emissions? Because everyone sort of on some level understands that their own locality is responsible for only a small percent of emissions. And so there's this social loafing problem. There's this free rider problem where everybody's like, well, someone else can reduce their emissions. I'm not going to reduce mine. Um, instead, it has to be a private monetary incentive to switch to solar. I got. We've got to have good. cheap I, solar. I got to run in one minute. So one minute. What is the most important low-hanging fruit America should do now to un-F ourselves? The most important low-hanging fruit is abolish the filibuster. <laughs> Make this country governable again. I don't care if there's a Republican majority. Let the Republicans pass some stuff. You know, abolish the filibuster so that the federal government can actually govern. Start doing stuff. Um, please do it, even if you're a Republican. Okay. That's great. That's great. Do it. Noah said so. <laughs> well, Noah, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, you've been, you've been great. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. It was really fun. Special thanks to our sponsor, Bismarck Analysis, for the support. Bismarck Analysis creates the Bismarck Brief, a newsletter about intelligence-grade analysis of key industries, organizations, and live players. You can subscribe to Bismarck Brief at brief.bismarckanalysis.com. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Narratives. Special thanks to Donovan Dorrance, our audio editor. You can check out Donovan's work and music at donovandorrance.com.